Hello and welcome back everybody. We are right back here on the walls outside of the monastery and we're ready to progress quite a little bit of ways further into the game. There's quite a few enemies out there but before we do any of that we want to equip Persistence. The fantastic greatsword that the first warden dropped and this weapon is going to be very handy for clearing through these ooh, first enemies. Let me just have a look-see. Okay, I just wanted to make sure I was still in medium weight class, and I am. Barely, but it works. Because this persistence, even with uh, the unupgraded version that we have, it's still enough to one-shot the weak Rogar and two-shot these Marauders if we can avoid getting hit in the first place. As you can see, it does just a ton of damage and is going to be really valuable in clearing through this section of the game. And while it would have been better if we could have beaten the first warden without getting hit, so we could have its little special properties, it still will do us just fine without. And so we can come on over here and pull a pair of levers in order to open up this gatehouse over here. And then we can progress a little bit further into the game. But right now, I'm just kind of enjoying looking at Persistence. It's such a fantastic looking weapon. It's really cool design and I'm just really glad that they give it to you so early especially since we're probably gonna be getting rid of it fairly soon just because there's better weapons to come so I think it's best we enjoy it while we have it and I think that's one of the real strengths of this game is that they're always giving you bigger and better weapons that you come to like and enjoy and they all feel kind of personal but uh Right now, let's talk to this monk here. You... help me, please! What happened to your hand? Spider venom. It burns like Adir himself touched it. Rip the wound and suck the poison out. Too late. It already spread. There's only one way to stop the venom. Separate the poison limb from the body. Pretty grisly. You want me to cut my arm off? You're a madman. You will see the judges soon, then. I can't. I won't. It's in your hands. Oh, well. I mean, if you insist, I guess I can cut your arm off for you. All right. On your head be it. Look how nonchalant it is. It's like, oh, yeah, no. I think I'll, uh... Thank you. I think I'll cut your arm off now. I owe my life to you, stranger. Wait. You're not one of the monastics. Markings on your face. A gift from the court, a reminder of my sins. Please, put the axe down now. <laughs> now we can put the axe down. We've already dismembered you enough for one day, but you really should get that looked at. That's, that's not going to do too well for you yourself. Long in this state. I am the healer monk here, and yes, I see the irony. See, the, the game situation. recognizes the irony. We don't need to point it out. I do. They're in the laboratory, but the place is full of Rogar beasts. It's no use. I won't make it there in this condition. Now, this is going to be one of the more important moments of being a goody two-shoes. We're going to hand him a potion yeah, to kind of take one. care of him. And that's actually a pretty big sacrifice early on. Doubly so for this class, because as you can see, it actually takes away from your maximum stock of health potions. And you're given that option like a few times throughout the course of the game and each time it's a very tough decision because uh, you get good rewards for giving up those potions but you you have to give them up permanently not only do they take from your stock of active potions like if i just had an empty potion bottle it wouldn't use up one of those i have to actually give him one of the potions that still has serum or whatever it is in it so it's going to reduce the heals I'm going to have on that run specifically in between checkpoints. And it also just reduces your maximum capacity overall, which is a very damaging blow this early, especially for the warrior class, which starts out with the minimum possible uh, number of potions with only two. And while you do get to pick up three in the monastery uh, tutorial section, that's really not a whole lot considering that I only have four, even at this point. They do give you some 
light armor to start you off. It's really nice to substitute that in for medium or lighter armor, but since we're already wearing heavy armor, we don't really need to worry too much about swapping time to lighter stuff. Then again, we did pick up the symmetry set over there on the bridge near that ambush of the three Rogar, so we are going to swap that in as soon as I get a break by coming down here and heading through the door because I want to make sure that I'm being as defensive as possible and focusing on heavy armor since that's kind of the theme for this character. So you can sub some of that in. As you can see, it's a really big difference in weight but also in defenses and poise, so it's definitely going to be worthwhile to sub some of that in. Uh, let's see, is the, how, do, how can I afford this? Let's see, if I go down to hot blood, can I actually slap on full symmetry? Not full symmetry, but mostly. So I think that's going to be what the armor setup is. That increases my defenses by a whole lot and allows me a really nice buffer going forward from here and that's going to make all these health potions more effective since I'm going to be taking less damage each time I actually do get caught up in a combat. No, there is nobody here and there's no items but you gotta be on guard because there's a little ambush right here where this marauder is set to do horrible nasty things to you if you're not paying attention but luckily I know that he's there and I've figured out that ambush through several uh, mistakes, but we can come on here, clear out the room, and then open this chest, which is an interesting little mechanic. You can actually sacrifice runes to open special chests and doors for great rewards. Like in this one, it gives you more good armor, specifically live elements, and an attribute Ninth shard. Night on watch. How could the Rokar get inside the sacred walls of Keystone? appeared out of nowhere. The graveyard is swarming with them. I need to alert the others. The attribute point shard is actually one of the best items in the game insofar as you can use it at any time and that will give you a free point to spend in any of your attributes without actually increasing the cost of leveling up at all. So they are extremely valuable especially as the game goes on because when the cost of leveling up your attributes goes up and up and up, they still remain as just static boosts to your stats, which is fantastic. This right here, really a mechanic I was disappointed with, but uh, let's, let's have a look see at what it does. This is the magic or range system of the game, and it is very, very lackluster and underwhelming. It takes the form of this here gauntlet. It allows you three different moves. As you saw in the cutscene, there's a projectile. There's also the ability to lob an explosive that will detonate after a time. And the final option is a magic blast. I don't have the mana for it right now, but it functions basically like a short range shotgun blast. Suffice it to say, all of the uh, magics you can use with it are very underwhelming. Uh, you can use runes in the sockets to augment the damage and give it special effects based on which move you're using, but it's overall just incredibly underwhelming and really feels like a shoehorn mechanic because they felt like it feels like they just had to give the character some form of range combat and so they eventually decided on implementing the gauntlet and I honestly think it's the weakest part of the game by far. So ignore that and you should and have a pretty good time of it. My research is over. I dare to claim that this gauntlet does only one thing, but it does it rather well. It eats hatred like a hungry lion and spits it out like a dragon spits fire. Its bearer can wield it like a horrible weapon, but his soul must not be pure. A shattered soul will make the most out of this device. Isn't that just convenient? Works so nicely for us that we of the shattered soul are the ones to pick up that horrible evil thing. But there we go, cleave right on through him. And there's a nice little chest over here waiting for us. In fact, there's several chests throughout this uh, tower, so we're gonna have quite a few of those to pick up. Mighty Antanas, I've found traces of a Rogar Lord 
that was once known for his preoccupation with the physical form. And his shield being no less than a weaponry masterpiece. That's most peculiar. As I would never have suspected Rogar to care for it. No wonder he had the most dedicated followers in all the battles he commanded. This is one of the parts of the game that I think is really clever and works on a variety of game design levels. And that's the fact that they always give you a audio log, an audio log, that kind of prepares you for the next boss you're going to face. Gives you a brief description of who they are, what they're focused on, and what their abilities are. As you can see there, I kind of cheese that incredibly strong enemy with the shield bash attack in order to push it off the edge, but honestly, that is the safest way to take that guy on. He has about 400 health and can two-shot you even if you're wearing very heavy armor like I am now. So that's just an enemy you do not want to get involved with. And it's actually really important that you take him out now because not only does it mean you're safe to progress through this section of the game, which has a very nice reward at the end, but it also means that you don't have to backtrack to this location later in the game because you will have to kill that spider enemy specifically in order to complete a quest later in the game that is actually attached to the uh, monk that we saved earlier. So whenever you're coming this way, make sure you've taken care of it. Otherwise, you're going to have to spend a lot of time backtracking. And that is just not something that you want to be caught doing. In this little chest here is another fantastic early game weapon, especially for strength characters like myself. It is the Fate Axe. It is almost exactly as strong as the... Uh, whatchamacallit, the greatsword persistence that we've been using thus far, and in some respects its moveset's a little bit better. I thought I could get the charge attack off before he came at me, it turns out I was wrong, so instead we're just gonna come at him with a pair of chops. He's gonna get back up in a little bit, because he's one of those sleeping Rogar, but we can take him out the moment he comes back up. And this is kind of where they introduce that mechanic for real, is that there's several different types of Rogar. The ones with these black hoods will actually pop back up after being killed the first time and need you to uh, kill them again in order to be, quote, perma-dead. But most of the other types of Rogar, at least the other two types of Rogar, are fairly simple to deal with and only need to die once in order to be properly taken out. This right here is a fantastic agility weapon, which means we're going to completely ignore it. Prejudice is a really great staff if you're an agility character, but we're going strength and faith, so that can pretty much rot in our inventory for all I care. I'll go into it in more depth when I actually do a dedicated agility run, which is what my next uh, playthrough of this game is going to be. Presently, I intend to do at least one uh, run with this Paladin character, take it through the full regular new game cycle, and then head on to a secondary playthrough with a full agility character who's much more focused on pure agility rather than mixing agility with faith. But we're going to deal with that when the time comes. I want to see how well this does and whether there's anything interesting left for me to talk about once I've finished this up. But Coming over here to this secret chamber yields, as an ultimate result, this dagger over here, Yetka's Daggers, which are very useful if you're looking for a strong early game dagger and didn't manage to pick up the Shard of Heroes, but they're also a quest item in that you actually have to relinquish them to the owner in order to get access to another section of the game, so I'm going to give them up since they're an agility weapon, but I'll go once again further in depth on that when I get to the more in-depth run next time. Where is it? Where is what? Back off. This doesn't concern you. A little bit snippy over here. Don't drop him. He's just a monk. Whatever you want. You won't get an answer from a dead man. Seems it's your lucky day, altar boy. Luckily, she's not that cruel yet, but uh there we are. What's that about? They're liars, and worse besides, not only did they steal my family valuables, but they've hidden the pathway. The pathway? pathway. 
A door to places otherwise unreachable. Places that hold secrets, and secrets hold power. I was on my way there when the Rogar appeared out of nowhere. Why are you so sure it's still here? It's in the Book of Lineage, and the book does not lie. Yetka is a really interesting character. She's got a very convoluted storyline, but sure I really like how it's you? done, even if I don't I like her character. For bookworms, not lifters. Don't be a fool. The men in here are just as twisted and corrupt as the people outside. I bet Antanas, this savior, allows it. They've bled the villagers dry over the years. They think people forget that the truth gets buried with the bodies they helped create. But they're wrong. I know what they did. As you can see, she's a little bit of a conspiracy theorist, but she does serve as a nice little foil to this really regal and pious monastery aesthetic that we're kind of surrounded with. So it works out pretty nicely in the end. Also, you need to talk to her a second time in order to Maybe you want hand to over her daggers. See, I'm looking for a dagger. Poor craftsmanship, simple, rusty. Seen it by any chance? Yeah, I might have found it. Found what belongs to you. You found it. Its engraving will point me toward the pathway. As soon as I can decipher it. Since I've no need to look in the catacombs anymore, you can have this key. There we go. She gives you a key to the catacombs, which are a far more late game area. They're right around the mid game. And we're going to deal with that in due time, but uh, it's also a really nice place to go if you're looking to get a jump start on some overpowered weaponry and whatnot. But since this is going to be a sort of basic run to start us off, I'm not going to ditz around with any of that. But let's equip ourselves for the incoming boss fight. Make sure we've got everything nice and set up. Uh, Nothing too important here. I am going to make sure that I have both Persistence and Fate on Hotkey since I want to be able to switch between the two. And we can fit in a little bit more armor, so let's see what we can do there. I'm sure we can swap, swap into the live elements. And now can we do full symmetry? With Persistence, we can't. Hmm. Swap that down to live elements. Okay, this will be the perfect armor set. We've got live elements and for our body and gauntlets, whereas symmetry for everything else. We're not going to equip Faithful Disciple because we're not using any magic. And I think we're pretty much good to head on in. Oh wait, wait a minute. If I take off my heavy shield, can I get symmetry gauntlets? I can. And while normally I would be very much opposed to ditching my shield, there's actually the special challenge of never using your shield in this boss fight that will get you an upgraded version of the boss's drop, which is really nice. Really wish I hadn't taken that hit there, but no matter. So we're going to go in here with as much heavy armor as we can muster. And here we are introduced to our second boss of the playthrough. Arguably the easiest boss in the game, but... He still makes quite the entrance. Really, really like how this guy looks. Even if he is kind of weak and easy to manipulate, still a very cool enemy. As you can see, he kind of focuses on staying behind that shield and doing a lot of AoE attacks, broad sweeping attacks. Nothing that I really need to worry about, so I'm just going to hold off until he uses an attack that is going to allow me to come in and punish. And Commander, just as much as the First Warden, really evidences the kind of design philosophy of this game when it comes to the bosses, is that uh, the bosses are set up so that, whereas with normal enemies, you can kind of control the fight, uh, take engagements where you want them, come in and attack whenever you want. Bosses are all about reacting and dealing with them as they come. One of the things we want to be sure to do is use the Shard of Heroes on this Cleric statue while uh, Commander is busy shielding up and sticking his minions on us because what that is going to do is make it so that he 
travels all the way over there and breaks the statue for us, giving us a ton of time to wail on his unprotected backside. And once the fight is over, we will reap the rewards of him breaking that statue, which is incredibly valuable. One of the strongest weapons you can get in the early game, and all around a nice place to start a playthrough if you're looking for something to really up your damage. The sun can get really obnoxious in this area, but I'm gonna try to avoid that. It'd be so much easier if I could just block those attacks, but I really want the upgraded loot from this guy, so I've gotta kinda dedicate to not using my shield or anything. Come on, give me an attack opening. As I was saying earlier, it's, it's all about uh, reacting to the boss, using what opportunities they give you rather than going in and making opportunities for yourself, which is very different to how something like Dark Souls plays, where it's all about uh, making openings for yourself and uh, kind of risk-reward, risking damage to yourself in order to sneak in a hit or two when you think you can. But that's Commander down, and we're gonna get his fantastic loot really shortly. Very happy about that. It's a great big stonking shield just like his and boy oh does it kind of carry you for this first section of the game if you're really hard up for a 100% block shield which both the other classes are and it's really nice to have the option to switch it up to a tower shield at this point in the game. Commander down and to the victor goes the spoils. Gonna run on over to him, pick that up. He also gives you fists, the arrowhead, but those are only important for agility characters. And over here, for breaking the statue, we get Cleric. Cleric is a fantastic hammer that does a whopping 86 base damage with zero scaling. However, you need to have 20, and it's not 26, but uh, 18 faith in order to wield it in the first place, so you really need to dedicate pretty heavily to faith in order to use it effectively, and that's exactly what we're going to be doing here, but I think this is a pretty nice place to end it. We took down the boss, got a new weapon, and we're going to be heading on to the next area in the next episode, so thank you so much for watching, and have a great day everybody.